Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Charles Goffrey. I'm the director of the uh, Martin School. And it's an enormous pleasure to introduce Pete Hudson this evening. It's a pleasure for two reasons. First of all, Pete is a superb scientist. And also, he's a very old friend. We've known each other for, I don't want to admit how long we've known each other. Pete is currently the Willimon Professor of uh, Biology at Penn State University. And before that was, uh, well, uh, when he moved to Penn State, was director of the Huck Institutes of Life Sciences in Penn State. Uh, but uh, Pete's a Brit, first degree at Leeds, DPhil here, and then worked at the Game Conservancy, followed by um, University of Stirling. And it was when working at the Game Conservancy, he started working on a classic problem in British ecology, which is why the red grass cycles in a regular, uh, in a regular manner. And there were various theories for it at the time, but Pete showed pretty conclusively that interactions with a parasitic nematode was, if not the major, one of the strongest drivers of these cycles. And then after moving to Penn State in 2001, Pete continued working on wildlife disease issues, um, building one of the strongest groups in the world in this area, the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics and branching out from grass to work on a menagerie of different systems, rabbits, mice, bats, amphibians, and many others. Um, but Peter's well known not only for his experimental work, but for shaping the emerging field of wildlife epidemiology, wildlife population dynamics. And beyond that, also working on, um, what, on how diseases affect community ecology, so disease community ecology. And Peter's also interested in uh, spillovers from, from wildlife diseases to humans and the other way around. So, for example, during the pandemic, he worked on the frequencies of SARS-CoV-2 in white-tailed de deer in North America. Uh, and in addition to being an a, um, excellent scientist, Peter's also a fanatical naturalist, a fanatical wildlife photographer, so we expect good slides, Pete and is very involved in a series of um, conservation projects, including a project helping the Maasai peoples in the Maasai Mara in Kenya and in a number of wildlife uh, film projects. Pete, please come and give us your lecture. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Charles. I do actually remember the last time we met in Oxford because it was the day that we graduated because I finished my DPhil at the same time that you finished your first degree. And there's just a photograph to actually prove it. I was actually going to look it up and show it, but then I thought that would embarrass both of us. But thank you very much and thank you to all of you for coming here. I'm very grateful indeed. And I'm going to, st uh, well, I'm very grateful to the Oxford Martin School. I must say I've been here for two weeks and I've had a really good time. I'm really enjoying myself. I really like this way of doing interdisciplinary science, trying to talk to people from other disciplines to try and see if we can find solutions to some of the problems we're facing today. So I'm going to try and sort of tackle that a little bit today. But I'm going to start and give you a scenario. Just imagine you're walking down the broad street, you pass Blackwells, somebody comes out, and they sneeze on you. Now, three or four years ago, you may well have turned around and actually say, bless you, not think anything more about it, you're a polite person, move on. But you're no longer a polite person. <laughs> now you say, what the hell, where's your mask? Go and lock up, you know, quarantine, stop doing this behavior. So the, COVID outbreak really has changed many components of our lives, and it's been absolutely um, confounding, both the political side, the social side, and the way we can try and solve these problems. And many of us who are looking at these sort of issues aren't so much worried about what's happening today, but how is it we're going to try and stop the next pandemic? Because, of course, the COVID pandemic was really a huge impact we're 1,150 days in, more than 700 million cases, 7 million deaths, and a loss, economic loss, in the region of 15 to 50 million trillion dollars. That's huge. So the real question is, what, how are we going to stop the next one? Before I start to think about that, I actually want to say, well, was that just 
a rehearsal for the next big one? Were we actually slightly lucky with this one? Could it have been much worse? Well, the case fatality rate was just 1.5%. With SARS-CoV-1, it was 10%. And if this case fatality rate had been even just a little bit bigger, we would have seen people in hospitals, people dying on the streets, sitting outside hospitals dying, and we would have had a real tragedy on hand. We were lucky, children weren't vulnerable. That really would have changed things. Perhaps associated with that, Africa had a low death rate. It seemed to evolve, to become less virulent, and then there were our amazing health workers during the whole of it. And you know, the vaccine world was in a really good place. mRNA vaccines ready to go. The MERS vaccine had just been done, and of course the Ox Oxford uh, a vaccine that developed from that was in the opportunistic place to just move straight forward. Just really, in many ways, we were very fortunate. At the same time, you could say we weren't so lucky. We had asymptomatic transmission taking place, short incubation period, and then, of course, what are the consequences of long COVID, and then the political confusion over transmission, the WHO, for example, telling us that it wasn't aerosolized till March 21, I think it was. And then the whole confusions about, ori about the origin and me having to listen to Trump because I now live in America. And then the politicization and the deniers and everything involved in that. <coughs> so my contention and what I'm going to try and tell you today is that really we can only prevent a pandemic at source. What I'm going to tell you is that disease invasion is an exponential process. And once it's established in the human population, with many of the infections we're looking at, it's very difficult to even contain it. We do indeed need what I'm going to call biomedical countermeasures, and I define those as things like vaccines, therapeutics, and the way we actually act against the infection to reduce suffering and mortality. But I'm going to talk and say that's Problems with time delays make even that containment difficult. So outbreaks can become pandemics. I think we've made a mistake and that we've thought about spillover really in a biomedical way, and I'm going to actually tell you that's an ecological process. This is an ecological process, and so it requires ecological countermeasures. And what's happened is people have tended to ignore that fact. And I'm then going to, for the second half of my talk, really try and show you some evidence to show you that I think we understand spillover and that we can do something about it. So I'm going to ask three questions. I'm going to ask, what are the patterns we see in disease emergence? What interventions do we currently have planned? And then what is the process of spillover and how are we going to prevent it? So, what are the patterns? Well, if you look back over the last 30 years, nearly all of the infections that have threatened or caused problems have been respiratory, viral, and come predominantly from bats and come through a bridging host. Can I use this? Can you see that? No, I don't think you can, or I can't see that you can see that. <coughs> so I will see if... Oh, there's a pointer. So if we look at the, but if we look at these viruses, Hendra, Nipah, SARS, MERS, you know, and even Ebola, suspected or confirmed coming from bats, and many of them used, into, in, used these bridging houses, horses, pigs, civets, camels. I don't use the word intermediate host, because an intermediate host in, in a parasitology is a specific host that is part of that system. It's an essential component of the life cycle. So I tend to use the word bridging host because I think that's what these hosts are. They're taking the virus from one species into another species. Of course, there's influenza as well. And influenza, of course, comes from birds and uh, can come through pigs. And by only choosing 30 years, of course, I have ignored HIV. And, you know, HIV has been a tragedy. Seven million dead with, uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2, but HIV, 40 million dead so far. So um, I'm still surprised how really 
AIDS had a, such a big effect. I mean, I would never expect a vector-borne disease to cause a pandemic, of course, because you're only going to get in the places the vectors are. But, and I do expect a respiratory disease, but a sexually transmitted disease is something I sort of still wake up and think, could that happen again? So let's go back to this whole point about the bridging host. Why are bridging hosts important? Why is it that the virus comes from bats, can cause an outbreak, but invariably have to go through a bridging host? Now, the predominant explanation is it's one of contact. It's a route, transmission route, where the bats contact a domestic animal, a livestock animal, a peridomestic animal, become infected, and then because they live with us, they then pass that over to ourselves and cause the outbreak. My experience, and my experience is limited because I've worked mostly on the Hernipa viruses, but in both of those cases, I would say the bridging host is important for amplifying the virus. So, for example, if I look, if I go to Australia and I take blood samples from bat carers, and these are people who should be exposed to many of the viruses coming from the bats that I'm interested in, they're not getting exposed. None of them are seroconverting. Well, just down the road, horses are getting infected and people are dying. And that, I think, is because the horse uh, is amplifying the virus and giving it to people and so killing them. So I think that's an important hypothesis, and I really think we don't put enough emphasis on understanding the dose response here. And it's something I'm always rabbiting on about. Are, are the emerging infectious diseases increasing? Well, the real answer is we don't know. We don't really have the sound data to be able to say that. But what we can say is it looks as though the rate of global spread is faster, and of course, we have better technology to be able to identify them. So it took HIV 56 years to get to the United States. SARS-CoV-1 took six months. Ebola, less than four months. SARS-CoV-2, two months. Omicron, seven days. And monkeypox, about 12 days. So it is really rapid, the spread. And you've got to appreciate that uh, now the mixing is such so big globally that any outbreak can result in things moving really fast. Now, the process that I think about and this is the process because it's from my viewpoint. And this is a series of papers done with uh, Raina Plowright. So Raina Plowright was a, a postdoc in my lab. She's now a full professor at Cornell University. And Raina basically runs this research. So uh, everything I talk about is in collaboration with Raina. And she is, she is definitely the lead PI these days. So the process is one we called infect, shill, uh, shed, spill, spread. You've got to be careful when you use so many S's, don't you? In fact, shed, spill, and spread. And my main interest has always been in the pre-emergent problems. What's happening to these viruses as they're circulating in the reservoirs? How they then expose themselves to humans. We then see a spillover process, and then we start to see emergence. We see the stuttering chains in the human population, we see some transients taking place. We'll see an outbreak, an epidemic, and then perhaps a pandemic. So my main focus has been on that reservoir and spillover side. And I did a paper in 2009 with Jamie Lloyd-Smith, who was working at our university at that time. And Jamie put together some 400 papers trying to integrate what we knew about this process. And he showed that in... A lot of studies, we knew a lot about what happened in reservoir hosts. So for things like rabies, we know a lot about how rabies circulates in the, in the wildlife host. And then we also know, in some infections, we know a lot about what happens in the humans. So with SARS-CoV-1, we knew a lot of details about that spread. And we know a phenomenal amount with SARS-CoV-2, of course, but almost nothing about spillover. And that's still the same today with SARS-CoV-2. I mean, we know very little about the reservoir and the spillover process. And that's an area. So at that point, I actually dropped what I was doing and said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life working on this, which is, in fact, what I've done. So the invasion process 
is really quite simple, and to epidemiologists, it's what we look at. A bridging host comes along, or an infected host comes along, there's a spillover event. The virus comes from the bridging host over into the human, and then that human enters a whole population of susceptibles, and that's r naught. So that's the average number of new infections in a population of susceptibles. And then what happens after that, of course, is R, which you hear in the news all the time. And that's how the spreads through the population, how it burns through. It's a fire burning through the, their susceptible population. But there are variations in that. There are some individuals which are super spreaders. Some individuals infect a huge amount. Do you remember the case of the guy who was singing at the choir and infected 60 people in his choir because he sat at the back and then he was just spread and infected everybody and then left and everybody got infected. So Arnold is quite good because it tells us a bit about the likelihood of invasion. It gives us the shape of the outbreak. And what we tried to do, of course, in, uh, in the COVID outbreak was to try and flatten that. So we tried to find ways we could push R0 down. And of course, if you push R0 down, then it really increases the time that's involved. So it tells us the likelihood of invasion, but it does not tell us anything to do with the heterogeneity and what sort of variation we see between different hosts. And this can be very important when we're concerned with invasion. So, for example, the number of cases involved, the number of people involved in those initial hosts, so if one of your hosts, your initial host is a super spreader, the likelihood of it getting established is much, much greater, of course. It's, it's pretty obvious, but it's also important. So it means there's always the possibility that even if it's difficult with a low R0, it can get in and start stuttering and get away from you. The speed of this invasion is R0 does not tell us anything about. And this was a huge misunderstanding during COVID. You have to know what the generation time is. You, and time and time again, people, when they were looking at new variants, made the assumption that the generation time remained the same. So, for example, there were people saying uh, R0 for Omicron was in the region of 18, which was absolute rubbish. And that's because they've made assumptions about the generation time. The generation time is also important because it tells us how long we have to contain an infection before it starts getting away from us. So if you look at this example here, I show you three recent outbreaks, Ebola, flu, and COVID. Generation times are very difficult, but after 35 days, and I'm just assuming it takes 35 days to recognize you have an outbreak taking place, you can see with Ebola, you only have 10 people infected. But with flu, you have 10 to the fifth. So you might be able to contain Ebola, but it's going to be very difficult to contain a, a flu or a COVID outbreak. And of course, if you were to say, well, we could get vaccines out in 100 days, and that's not just a random figure, that's the figure that the Rockefeller Institute are trying to do at the moment, then you can see that the number of people, even if you had your vaccine already produced and ready to go, you really have uh, the population, it's really getting away from you. Hence, I'm trying to sort of say it's very difficult to prevent a pandemic from taking place. Of course, outbreaks are exponential, and it's something that is perhaps often sort of ignored, but they do multiply very, very fast. If we log transform that, what actually takes place is that many of the stochastic things, and I'm quite interested in those, occur within the first three to five generations. After that, it's deterministic, it's gone. So if we're going to be able to do anything, we really have to try and catch it as soon as possible. But we have huge problems with that politically, because with things like biological countermeasure, we have time delays, there's the political issues, there are the deniers, there's the switching between don't wear a mask, wear a mask, don't wear a mask, well, wear a mask. And then we have all the regulatory problems when you're trying to produce a vaccine, which can be really difficult and give you huge time delays. So even though I think the vaccine industry did a fantastic job, 
it was very too, it was almost too late. It had gone totally out of control. So I'm just sort of starting by saying outbreaks are exponential. The short generation time means for, to even contain it is difficult. And there are multiple time delays. So there are huge challenges in there. And so uh, I think we need some countermeasures that are based at source. Now, before I move into that, I just want to ask, what interventions do we have planned at the moment? What are the things we're going to, to prepare, respond, and prevent the next pandemic? So now I'm going to sort of just move into what other people are really saying. I see there are three ways of doing this. There's the pre-emergence way. It, what can we do to stop it getting from wildlife to us? And historically, that has been habitat destruction, slaughter of bridging hosts, and vaccination of the reservoir host. And, the, you know, it's amazing things like control of rabies by people like Sarah Cleveland, by vaccinating the uh, dog hosts, has been really quite remarkable. I still find it amazing that cattle vaccination against rinderpest, despite the um, abundance of animals in East Africa, still eradicated that. You can then try and contain it and control it. And of course, we use uh, trace, test and treat, and we can quarantine. Or we can try and sort of reduce the spread and the suffering with vaccines, antivirals and therapeutics. So what have people, and particularly people with money, started to talk about this? Well, Bill Gates was the first to come out with this book, How to Prevent the Next Pandemic. I couldn't find a single line in there where he actually said how he was going to prevent the next pandemic. <laughs> Nothing. He never thought about any proactive preve prevention that's going to stop, trans uh, stop spillover taking place. He talked about better tools, better tools for genome sequencing. He had this global epidemic response and mobilization unit with 3,000 experts doing surveillance and data integration. Absolutely great. Better tools, vaccines within six months. Obviously, you know, the development of new platforms and things. There's huge amounts that can be done. And they're really important, and they need to be done. But Bill, they're not going to prevent the next pandemic, as far as I can see, given where we are at the moment. And then, of course, uh, Jeremy Farrar, who uh, has recently moved from being director of the Wellcome Foundation and now gone to be the science director at the World Health Organization. He's talking about, uh, also talking about better tools in his book, investing in infrastructure. He's, uh, he thinks there's a real need for sound financial footing. And he talked about a number of other things, but nothing in the proactive prevention. The Rockefeller Institute moved in quite fast, set up their Pandemic Prevention Institute, appointed Rick Bright, and put it, talking about sums of 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9th to dollars. Um, nothing on prevention. <laughs> uh, it was mostly about looking for crucial data gaps, but also huge initially, all about genomics and vaccines. Things that need to be done, important things that be, need to be done as biomedical countermeasures, but my whole point is they're not really going to stop a pandemic. Unfortunately, this is sort of folded now, and they've moved that into their Climate Institute. And so they're sort of keeping the people there. Rick's moved on, but they're keeping their people there, but the Pandemic Prevention Institute now uh, no longer exists. And he sort of said it was because there's so much competition in the field, we don't need to do it, but I don't believe that. Um, and then within the past week, 10 days, WHO have come out with their zero draft, an international instrument on pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. And here, for the first time, we see some words that could be involved in proactive prevention. For the first time, they start talking about One Health. And if you read between the lines, may, well, if One Health really, and they don't define it, but if One Health is really about environmental health, it's about wildlife health, livestock health, and so human health, then maybe that interaction could do something. I think it's, at the moment, that's as far as they've gone. They haven't really thought about it any deeper. 
because they're very worried about achieving equity, they're worried about making sure the right transparency is there and that we're doing the right sort of things. So, uh, of course, they could, things could still change, but that's the first opportunity I've seen. I was excited when the Independent Panel on Pandemic Prevention, Preparedness and Response came out because I thought that looked like a great group of people. But once again, they had nothing on proactive pre prevention. And it was the sort of usual thing, stronger WHO, access to final financial resources. And I was disappointed because the Right Honourable Helen Clark is somebody I admire hugely. I just think she's a great intellect. She just does really good things. And when she was asked directly why the report didn't include anything on spillover, her response was, it's like boiling the oceans. And I was devastated because it clearly meant that they hadn't even thought about it. They hadn't even thought about what processes could be done. And I think it's fair to say that throughout the public health sector, most people think the spillover is unpredictable and unpreventable. And I'm not surprised because they don't think of that in an ecological way. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to try and introduce you to emergence as an ecological process. So yes, Charles, this is one of my photos. <laughs> emergence as an ecological process. What is that process? And how could we prevent spillover from taking place? We have a real problem undertaking research on spillover for two reasons. First of all, knowing where it's going to occur, and secondly, being able to get replication. You know, we think with SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, there was only one <coughs> spillover, well, maybe two spillover events with SARS-CoV-2. With Ebola, we know there's like 44, and I've worked quite some time with Vincent Munster, who works on it out there, but he, it's really difficult to know where and when it's going to actually happen. And then getting in there and getting your equipment. So we decided that we were going to focus on the HINIPA viruses. HINIPA viruses because both there's been a reasonable number of spillovers. That was the primary reason to do it. And of course, they're coming from bats. So the dominant hypothesis throughout is that stochastic and hierarchical interspecific transmission happens to drive spillover. Now, another way of looking at that <laughs> is that it is essentially a random process. And, you know, my really good friend Eddie Holmes always, always said to me, you'll never be able to do it. It's just that. It just happens to take place. Since then, Rainer and I and our colleagues at the Bat One Health, and there are several other hypotheses but I don't think there's any data for them in either way. But I'm going to tell you about our hypothesis, which is that land use induced spillover, that is the disruption of habitat critical to the reservoir host, displaces the host to novel habitats where they shed virus and pass that to susceptible bridging hosts or to humans. The idea being that habitat disruption, climate disruption interact, they disrupt the food, the hosts are displaced, and this is a, separates it from all the other hypotheses, and the hosts then move into situations where they contact bridging hosts and humans, so they move out of their natural habitat, and they move into a habitat where they essentially contact humans. That's a big, that's a big difference to what everybody else says. So let me start by telling you the story about Hendra virus, case study. I'm going to go back to 1994, and this guy, Vic Rails, he was a horse trainer in Hendra, which is just where the airport is if you've ever flown into Brisbane, so you actually land in Hendra when you fly there. And he was very famous for this horse, which is called Vaux Rogue, and he was at a race one day, he came home, and one of his horses at pasture, a mare that was at pasture, was showing some neurological disorder. It was frothing at the mouth, it was choking, it was not in a very good way. It looked as though it had COVID. <laughs> and what he did, which was the right thing, he brought it into the stable, 
and he rang the, in, the vet who was on uh, call at the moment, who happened to be a friend of mine, Peter Reed. Peter Reed came over, and the horse was really bad, and he had to euthanize it there and then. Over that time, of course, that horse died. There were 21 horses on Vic's stable that were, got involved. 14 of those actually died. Vic himself got infected and had to be rushed to hospital, and he died. And his stable hand got very sick and was taken into emergency care, but he survived. They took the samples from Vic, they sent them off for analysis, and identified a new virus, which was the Hendra virus. And it's killed well more over 100 horses since then, with a case fatality rate of 75%. That's big. You know, COVID, 1.5%. Horses, 75%. With people, case fatality rate of 57%. Peter called a meeting amongst the horse owners to tell them what was going on and to tell them, and he said he'd looked everywhere, could not find what the reservoir host was. He'd sampled everything he could find in the fields in a round fixed house. And then one of the horse owners said, have you ever been out at night and done it? And he goes, what do you mean? He said, there are huge numbers of bats going over. So then uh, um, he then passed that over to Hume Fields. No, sorry, a bit of a senile moment there. Hume Fields then went out and started sampling bats. And he found it in present in many of the bats. And these are the sort of five main bat species. I'm talking flying foxes, the big big lovely bats, I'll show you them in a minute, and there are four species, the black flying fox has is, is got the green distribution, the red dots are where the spillover, and they're the main species, and then the grey-headed flying foxes, uh, Teropis polycephalus down here, are the blue species, and they also get it as well. But I got so excited by bats because they are just so different from other animals. They really are remarkable animals, and I think of myself as a naturalist. But the life expectancy, given their body size, is well off the scale. They're absolutely incredible. They have more than 4,800 coronaviruses. They have a robust interferon response to our RNA viruses. They have a remarkable anti-inflammatory response. Of course, being a flying species and all the things they do, they have to have very good DNA repair systems. They are just really different from everything else you do. And it was that that really attracted me in the first instance to come and look at them. Their space use is nothing like you expect. They will get up and they will fly a thousand kilometers to visit a tree that's in flower. And there it is pumping out the nectar and they will feed themselves silly like a five-year-old child and then they will rush around as if they're having a sugar burst, you know. They're just like a five-year-old child. They're just amazing. Then they'll turn around and come back again. What they're really looking for, particularly during the winter months, are a relatively small number of species, five eucalyptus trees, which come out and flower during the winter months. And they come out every winter, except for when there is <coughs> disruption from the oceanic Nino situation. So what happens then is we see a cool phase happening in Australia. So there's this difference in temperature across the Pacific, and because of that, Australia ends up with a huge amount of rain and, uh, and uh, not very nice low temperatures. And because of that, the flowering trees stop producing. And at that stage, the, um, the flying foxes, the uh, bats, stop feeding and go into sort of starvation phase. Normally, under normal conditions, they're very nomadic. They will go huge distances, as I said, but they will live in camps with hundreds of thousands. So these camps are really quite remarkable, and the sky almost goes black as they're flying out at dusk, just because of the large numbers of them. Within the colonies, within the camps, the males defend branches, and then the females come and hang out next to them, and you can, I don't have to think, I can, don't have to point out which is the male there, I think it's obvious. But they, uh, and then once the female, if a female lands, he basically gets access to her and tries to get a mating and things like that. Most, if not all, of the Hendra spillover occurs during that winter months when the, there are food shortages 
available. We monitor the amount of um, Hendra coming out of these bats via urine samples. So because bats hang upside down all the time, they can't pee when they're hanging there, so they have to turn themselves upside down. And you'll see this individual on the right is actually urinating. You'll see the drops coming out of the back. And you know when they're urinating because they turn, as I said, they turn up the, right, the other way round. Quite sensible not to pee on yourself, really. Although there's this sort of mist of urine in these colonies, which I always think it's a mist of virus. And, you know, as somebody who's interested in transmission, you think, how the hell is transmission taking place? Is it actually taking place by one urinating on another, and then they lick it off, and they have to get sufficient dose? Or is it just this, this huge mist of urine out there, where they're sucking in the virus? What are the, and we were able to go around and put plastic sheets out underneath it, and collect the urine as it hits it, and then run samples on that. And, what our data shows is that if the best predictor for spillover is the viral load, which brings me back once again to dose. So it's not the prevalence, it's the viral load that we're actually seeing in the samples. So let's get back to my uh, hypothesis and apply it to the Hendra spillover system. So the hypothesis, if you remember, is that there's habitat disruption that should interact with climate or could interact with climate giving you food shortages, and then the bats are displaced, and they move into horse fields. And then when they move into horse fields, they're feeding on poor quality food, where they chew it, spit it out, and then urinate on the pasture. And horses, because of the way they um, breathe and graze, and they suck up all this virus, they become infected. And horses are just one of those animals, like pigs, that when they get a viral infection, it's just it's just dreadful. It's just a huge infection. One of the vets told me that when I was with him looking at some of these places, visiting these different locales, he said, at this place, the horse had it. I rushed in, and the owner was just about to open the horse's mouth, and I had to, because they thought the horse is dying from swallowing its tongue. And he said, as soon as anybody opens the horse's mouth, they just get a face full of the virus, and that's how the humans get it. And that's where the whole idea about dose sort of came from. That's why I love going out in the field to do these sort of things. So how do we test that hypothesis? Well, I'm going to tell you how I wanted to do it in a minute. But what we did do is we went out and studied the flying fox ecology. For 25 years, this remarkable field biologist called Peggy Eby, despite not having funds, has, in this part around eastern Australia, which is where Brisbane is, you might recognize it, going down as far as Sydney, it certainly goes down, that's the Gold Coast, because that's uh, um, New South Wales and Queensland there, the division. And she went and regularly counts all of the bat roosts. She records uh, their location, when they move, how many go to those places. She records the reproductive output, because you can see the babies hanging on the females. And then we were recording the spillover events and the winter flowering pulses, and so getting an estimate of food shortages. What Peggy's data show very nicely is that there are two periods. There's a period of stability, which is on the left. And that period of stability is when the number of bat roosts remained constant. And it remained constant until 2002, after which it then increased. So between 96 and 2002, the orange lines show you periods of food shortage. And even though there were food shortages, the bats did not fission and go into smaller roosts. During this whole time period, the number of bats remained constant. But after 2002, we saw a change in the situation that when there was a starvation period, a food shortage period, the bats fissioned, and we saw more roosts take place. And every time there was a food shortage, so we saw more fissioning, even though the number of bats. So that over the time period, we saw it go from 100 roosts to 300 roosts. What was more was we were seeing the spillover events and these bat roosts taking place in different habitats. So this figure shows you the change in the percentage forestry, percentage agriculture, and the urban areas. But in these agro-urban areas on the left, and the red dots are the spillover events, 
That's where it was taking place. We didn't see very many spillover events in the forest where the bats really should be hanging out. But because they're starving, they're moving into these urban areas where they're feeding on things like tangerines and figs. And they're not on the flowers that they really want to feed on. And it seems to us that what's happening is they're moving over there to um, try and take advantage of these foods. And in so doing, coming into contact with the horses as the bridging hosts. So this is the critical figure that really sums it up. So initially, there's the period of stability on the left. The number of bats are remaining constant. This shows you the ocean, the ONI index. And when it goes above 0.8, that means the conditions are such that we should see a starvation take place. We should see a food shortage take place. So one is the climate disruption. Then two is the food shortage. And during that period of stability, you saw it being one, two. In 2000, we saw a food shortage event without an ONI uh, prediction of that. But then we saw another one in 2002, 2003. After that, it goes from being a, a double punch, one, two, to one, two, three, one, two, three, where we're seeing climate disruption, driving food shortage, and then spillover events actually taking place. And the size of those spillover events are determined by the size of these um, circles. So this is a classic, uh, 2011. Uh, so this was one of the classic cases. Here's the ONI, goes over 0.8, the the, which means that the climate is really wet, the trees don't come into flower, the trees aren't in flower, there's a food shortage the next year, and because of that, we see a spillover event take place in the year afterwards. Never did we see a spillover event take place during a time when there was productive flowering. So this figure shows you once again, period of stability, then the period of rapid change. The dots are number of spillover events, and the, and the black lines are the periods of productive flowering. And we never did we see this taking place. Now, if we take all these data and assess them in a conditional, in, uh, in a Bayesian network model, then what this tells us is that climate oscillations had a positive effect on food shortage and persistently and caused this fissioning in the bats. This resulted in spillover when they were in these agricultural areas. But if there was a late winter flowering event, then that would stop it. So we think this is quite nice support for the generalizable hypothesis that disruption of habitat, disruption through climate interact to influence food abundance and so displace the hosts. So they go off, contact bridging hosts, and then cause spillover. I think this is the parsimonious explanation for why it takes place. But of course, we now have to start thinking about other systems. Could it be taking place in other sorts of systems? And this is Nipah virus here. And what happens with Nipah virus is it's transmitted when people drink palm juice. They come and put pots under the trees in Bangladesh, where we study it, with Emily Gurley, just fantastic person to work with, and collect the palm juice and then drink it. But the bats come along, they lick it, they're clearly starving, and they pee in it. And when they pee in it, so when they drink it, they get the dose of infection. Uh, her postdoc, Cliff McGee, has done a whole series of things along to see if it works with this hypothesis. Uh, we certainly get the uh, bats breaking, fissioning into the smaller groups. We see massive habitat destruction there. And we think that could be driving it. And of course, Nipah virus is one of the things we're really scared about in the future because Nipah virus has been shown to have human-to-human -human transmission. And I think before COVID, this was the virus that we were most worried about. Ebola, well, now we're really pushing because we really don't have data on this. So it's quite possible that in Guinea, where we've seen massive palm oil move in there, that, that as, uh, the bats are starving. Because of that, they're moving into the villages. And maybe that's why the Ebola outbreak took place, the, spill the initial spillover took place. If we go even further and say, well, what about uh, horseshoe bats? Uh, Rhinolophilus bats, I don't know why I can't say it today, 
and they're insectivorous. So they're very different. Everything else I've talked about up to now really have been the teropid bats that are feeding on nectar. The horseshoe bats, of course, are insectivorous. So there's a very different system there. And maybe it doesn't apply, but maybe it does. There is evidence coming out of David Heyman's lab that in the part of Yunnan where we know or we believe that uh, COVID originated out of the bats, that there's high forest fragmentation, high densities of livestock, high human density. And these bats may well be disrupted and they may well be moving around looking for food and coming into the house. But that work still has to be done. But I think it's something that could be done. One of the things is, one of the things we've been working on, in fact, um, Tim Coulson and I submitted a paper to science on policy in this and ecological countermeasures this week, is we've been thinking about what are the countermeasures we could actually take to try and prevent this taking place. The obvious one is to do strategic habitat restoration. We know which species we want to be there, and we have four or five species that we really want to put out there. And they're also the same species that people involved in koala restoration and people worried about the loss of endemic birds in Australia are also worried about. We know where the distribution is, we know where the re reliable winter habitat is, and a very small proportion of that, 0.4%, is actually protected at the moment. And many of those areas are, in fact, the good agricultural areas. But I am so gratified when I go to Australia and talk to landowners. They said, yeah, we'll do that on our land. We'll put out small plantations. And the one thing that I love above all else is that we were funded by DARPA to do this work in America. So the Department of Defense gave us $11 million to say we should go and plant trees in Australia. I just think that's great. <laughs> I think that's really wonderful. What I want to do, but nobody else wants to do, is I want to go out. I mean, there is a problem with doing, uh, doing all of this, and that is it's going to take 15 years before we can see the first flood. So that's a ridiculous time delay. We can predict. We've, been, we've shown it. We've published it before outbreaks have occurred. We've shown that we can predict outbreaks. We can predict spillover events taking place. So if we can do that, we could go out and do short-term feeding experiments. I find it very easy when I go around the tropics because I take sugar water and a, and a hummingbird feeder and I put it up, and within minutes I can have bats coming in and feeding off those. I think it would be relatively simple to set up feeding stations around eastern Australia to do it in a replicated, randomized way, going, OK, we predict this time next year we're going to have spillover events there and there. So we're going to do treatments, controls, reverse them, do the whole business, get the replication up there. Because I think we need the right metrics. But uh, I'm a sole voice in that, this choir at the moment. And I'm going to keep pushing this one until somebody sees the light. Because I think we need to be able to show that ecological countermeasures really do work. We just got to go out there and show it. And I think that's the way we do it. At the end of the day, what I'm really after is a balanced portfolio. You know, I don't want you to think for a minute that I'm anti-vaccines or anti-therapeutics. Absolutely not. All I want to do is try and recognize that biomedical countermeasures need to be balanced with ecological countermeasures. I think the work, and all credit to Raina for leading this work, she's been absolutely superb. She has given us the view where we have these insights into spillover. We can predict. Therefore, I think we can prevent. So the public health notion that it's unpredictable and unpreventable, I would say, has been refuted. And there's a, uh, I don't know if you've read Chris Dye's book. Chris is in the audience. Thanks, Chris. But one of the lovely things that Chris does in his recent book, uh, which is called, <laughs> remind me, go on, make it easy for me. You won't. What, what, the title of your book. Well, it's about, it's about prevention. And it's called The Big Health. The Great Health Dilemma. The, thank you. The Great Health Dilemma. I beg your pardon for forgetting it. I should have written it down. I thought I was going to have my case with me because it's in my case. Of course it is. I take it everywhere. I get. But in that book, 
Chris does this very nice way of looking at it and sort of saying there's an insurance policy approach we need for emerging diseases. You can't just insure, you can correct me afterwards, uh, you, ca you can't just insure for one disease, we need to insure for all of it. And then by having that shared risk, it becomes an insurance basically approach. And I'm, going, I'm proposing this is one of the ways we can cover many emerging diseases. It also has the huge benefits of mitigation against climate and biodiversity loss. I have to say that was my primary reason for doing this work at the beginning. I am really interested in how we can prevent biodiversity loss. And of course, it's equitable as well. I could do the quick cost-benefit analysis. And if you say this pandemic cost us 30,000 30, billion, the ecological costs for doing this are in the region of 28 billion. The benefit ratios there is extraordinary and quite acceptable. And I've been looking up trying to find alternatives and the uh, WHO approach to COVID va COVAX vaccination for low and middle income countries is also in the same sort of order of magnitude. So I think that is quite a nice way of thinking about it. It's not excessively expensive. It's not, it's not impossible. I think we can do something about it. Of course, all the rubbish in this was by me. I want to point out that Raina was the person who really is the leader now of this, and she's doing a fantastic job. And just say how wonderful it is working with people like Peggy E.B., Emily Gurley, Barbara Hahn. Dan Jacobson is helping us predict where hotspots and things are. And there's a lovely group of other people as well. Charles, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Many thanks, Pete. That was uh, absolutely brilliant. Uh, I'm going to ask the first question, if I may. So I was a bit surprised when you said how it little... It was 1979. <laughs> yes, I'm sure it was. Uh, how little attention um, was being paid to prevention. But the whole issue about wet markets and, and, oh, yeah. um, and uh, the consumption of wild animals and things, yes. is that not something where there's quite a lot of attention to try and prevent spillovers into humans? Uh, I'm not saying there isn't. Mm. I put this talk together with slides and then had to cut it in half twice, and that was one of the things Thank that you. I sort of um, uh, knocked out. I mean, the whole, I think, with the COVID and the information that we had from the wet market, particularly the work uh, that, and I've forgotten her name, the person who leads the virology lab in Amsterdam, I'll think of her name in a minute, uh, did fantastic stuff there, showing us that, I, that you know, the evidence is that it really could easily have come through there. And yes, of course, wildlife trade is immensely important there. I mean, it's just almost a no-brainer. I feel silly sort of saying it. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. Um, j just to warn people that the uh, lecture is being live streamed. So when you ask a question, j just realize that. Let me go to the first question right at the back. Sorry, Clara. That's fine. And those of you listening online, please use the button to ask questions remotely. Thanks for a, a really fascinating talk. Um, uh, do you need to know the genetic sequences of viruses circulating in wild animal populations in order to perform these ecological countermeasures? So I don't think we have to know them. But I think if we're going to understand, and I think if we're going to get insight, I mean, I've been in research since, well, since 1979, so that's whatever it is, 44 years. And time and time again, I am shocked at how I think a system is incredibly complex. But when I actually get to understanding it, how simple it really is. That's why everything I've published is boring and obvious. But what I'm working on today is really, really cool. Um, but I think it's good to know that. I think it's good to have the insights. I think when we're looking in the human population, the genomic sequencing is really telling us where we've been. That's insightful for understanding the processes and things. It doesn't necessarily tell you where you're going to go. I do think breakthroughs in serology are immensely important. 
And I do believe very strongly in really what the Oxford Martin School is trying to do, which is trying to integrate multiple techniques, multiple approaches, multiple uh, disciplines to try and solve these big problems and these, uh, these very difficult problems. So, so I think we do need all of that. But sometimes I think we're just a bit stupid. Thank you. Uh, Chris at the front, and then do wave when you want to ask a question. I'll do Chris and one from the live stream, and then the gentleman there. Thank, thanks very much, Peter. Thanks for the book plug, <laughs> first of all. Um, but I, I'm, you leave I'm the check on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm still one of those people that believes that spillovers are essentially unpredictable. Uh, it, if you look at all of the big pathogens that you spoke about right at the start of your talk, Ebola, H1N1, HIV, they were all essentially unpredictable. So what I get from your presentation is this wonderful, beautiful calibration of the Hendra system and possibly the Nipper system. And that allows you to predict or re-predict something that's already happened because you've characterized the essentials of that system. But how do you apply that idea more generally to predict essentially the unpredictable? We don't know what the basic, we don't know what the primary hosts are going to be. And if I can just come, animals are. and if I can just come in there, uh, uh, Nick Wilcox says, can you can your approach protect against unknown pathogens? A similar question to a similar question. So this is a slide done by my colleague Dan Jacobson. And he works at Oak Ridge. And what Dan is doing here is he's predicting hotspots for environmental disruption. And he does this through, through three-way correlations. And then does it daily, I think it is, those sort of predictions are actually made. I was really, and so first of all, I can actually quite say, well, most of those problems in the Arctic and Antarctic, those, those we can ignore because those aren't the sort of places we're going to see emerging diseases. But I can look at bat distribution, I can look at a number of other factors and start to focus in there. And I was really gratified when I first saw it because I said, Dan, let, show me exactly what's happening in East Australia. And he said, that is definitely a hot spot. And there's another one in Bangladesh and a couple in other places. So I think we can uh, spatially say these are the sort of, we could quite easily, and Dan's working on this at the moment, uh, but say where it is we should be looking and how we should be doing the surveillance. And then I think that's taking us a step forward. I don't think it's totally unpredictable. I think we can do that. I think this could be done. And with technology now, I think we could do it really well. But I think you really have to decide where you're going to go and look. And don't look, at, don't look in 100 haystacks in 100 fields for the single needle. Start saying, OK, the haystack we need to look in is that, and it's going to be in the left-hand side, it's like that. Having said that, I think the ecological countermeasures is still a very good approach to take. I just love the ideas, planting trees for human health. Question there. Hi, uh, Miles Carroll. I'm a classified observer, a virologist here in Oxford. Um, I'm, I'm halfway, halfway with you, but uh, not completely. Uh, anything, though, that um, can be argued to plant more trees, obviously, are uh, positive things. Uh, so that's a, a, great, a great thing to support. So your, your Hendra Nipper uh, story is, is, a, is, a, is a nice one, but you know, I, I'm paralleling some of the um, comments before. I, um, I do a lot of work in West Africa on, on Ebola, and um, I can tell you that probably in a 10 kilometer radius of Miliandu, the spillover uh, village, uh, there are no palm plantations. There are definitely in the prefecture of Gekadu, but there are yeah. none there. So I think there's definitely an element of unpredictability, but you could definitely classify it as a risk area. Yeah. So, I mean, looking at your heat map there, that covers a lot of the globe. Yeah. And we can't be there all the time, but um, surveillance systems and rapid diagnostics can help. And rapid diagnostics is also a major key issue, is that we are seeing a minority yes. of the pillovers that actually occur, because to actually be on a map, you've got to, A, there's got to be a clinical uh, signal to get people to go there. You've got to have advanced molecular diagnostics, if not sequencing, uh, and you've got to catch the pathogen in the act. Yeah. So we are working slightly in the dark. Yeah, and predicting um, 
the, the next um, uh, epidemic, pandemic. WHO does this pretty well. Um, I was part of the um, committee in Geneva in 2018, where we predicted that the uh, most likely cause of the next uh, epidemic was going to be a respiratory um, a pathogenic uh, coronavirus. Um, but and then there's other eight other pathogens that we we also selected as, as high risk. So what the world is doing now is not trying to make one vaccine to one uh, virus. It's trying to make uh, vaccines that will cover a, a genus. If I mean, a family would be too much, yeah. but just maybe a genus. And we know maybe the top eight uh, um, risk viruses and families and genuses that are yeah. there. It's not easy, but it, it might do some good. But really do appreciate not just making uh, vaccines and medical countermeasures, yeah. it's actually preventing the spillovers uh, in the first place or getting there really early uh, and then try to isolate. Thank you. So thank you for your comments. I think, uh, and I do, I, I agree with almost everything you've said. I certainly don't want to try and say it's working in Ebola. Uh, I do, and I, uh, I think I'm with you totally because it's not just about the biomedical countermeasures. And if you just, uh, grasp the fact that there are ecological issues associated with spillover that would need to be addressed. I think I've succeeded. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for the talk. It was very informative and thought-provoking in a way. Um, so I'm not a virologist, I'm a bacteriologist. I have a question about uh, what are your views on re-emergence of viral outbreaks uh, such as the one which we are um, seeing right now for the Marburg virus in Ghana, uh, what can be the ecological countermeasures for the re-emergence of such viral outbreaks? Well, I think there are, uh, there are things I d didn't talk about. So, um, there, so for example, uh, so there are, I think, I just want people to think more openly than they've been thinking about. And I was very disappointed with the Gates and Jeremy's book and a number of other things. I just felt that they hadn't really thought outside the box enough. And so with Lassa fever, for example, people are talking about using transmissible vaccines and releasing those into the mice to control the, vaccinate the mice. Transmissible vaccines could work with bats, particularly if they spend a lot of time allegrooming each other. And, you know, if they're and if that could be passed through urine, they could be passed in the vaccine so that animals could vaccinate it. And um, quite a large section of my work, and Charles referred to some of that, was developing ways that animals could automatically use antelmintics and things to treat them. So I think there's a, there's a huge way of looking at that. And I'd be really happy to talk to you more about that and try and see ways of thinking about it. And I'm here or in biology every day for the next two weeks. So, um, and my office is just there. And also having a glass of wine after the talk. Andy. Oh yeah, a glass of wine, that's it. Thanks, thanks very much. You, you were not very enthusiastic about uh, uh, vectors as uh, agents to in increase the transmission and, and uh, for pandemics. But uh, I mean, I think that um, perhaps with First of all, climate change, which, which may change the distribution of vectors, but also vectors as an initiating uh, step. And, and of course, the greatest pandemic that affected human populations was Yersinia pestis, the plague. Yep. And we, it looks as if what happened there was that climate change changed the distribution of rodents and their flea vectors. But probably what then drove transmission amongst humans in Europe was human to human transmission. Yes. And so as an initiating factor, vectors may still be very important um, for that. And I, I just wondered whether uh, being so certain about vectors not being critical is, is, is wrong in this, well, in this situation. Perhaps I, not, not necessarily for the whole world, but at least yes. as initiating factors. So I hope I, hope I didn't um, put that incorrectly. So my point was that I don't think a vector-borne disease is going to cause a pandemic because very few people in the world are, are exposed to one, uh, to one vector. However, I do agree with you that there are some real issues that we need to consider with vectors, and I've done quite a lot of work on those, particularly the tick-borne uh, diseases. But one of the things I'm, I was really fascinated with Zika was that Zika can be transmitted. Of course, we think of it as vector-borne, but there again, we know it can be sexually transmitted. It's transmitted in, in, by, uh, sexually, it's transmitted in multiple ways. And I think one of the things we get wrong, and I gave a lecture in biology, about, a talk in biology about this last week, 
is that we really need to think about there are multiple routes of transmission that we need to embrace. So while uh, in Zika the outbreak may have been caused, or an outbreak may be caused by a vector, it's the actual onward transmission is through other techniques, other systems. And when we do the modeling, we, try to, we tend to say, oh, we're going to take this model because it's a vector-borne model, or this model because it's respiratory, and that, that's not necessarily the right thing to do. Thanks. Can I just ask if your 28 billion is just for Australian bats? No, that 28 billion was globally, and that was a figure I didn't come up with. That was a figure somebody else came up with. But yes, that was to tackle the wildlife trade and to do habitat restoration. I'm just going to go to one online before going to the lady in the front. Uh, this is from Harriet Bartlett. Is there a risk that habitat restoration could increase spillover risks, at least transiently? Before habitat is established, it is likely to have disturbance characteristics that might increase spillover risk. Yeah, really interesting point. Yes, there could be a, could be a situation there, couldn't it, where you could get that taking place. I think it'd be really nice to uh, do a paper on that if you want to. <laughs> Well, Harriet is based in this building normally, so she should come yeah, and have I was, a chat. Yeah, she isn't here, she obviously, <laughs> so I'll, be, I'll see her next time. Hello, I'm, I'm a physicist, so I don't know very much about this subject, right. but I, to what extent are you able to take account of political effects, such as, for example, the refusal, apparent, of the Chinese government to give a good start to the possible launch in Wuhan of the latest of the corona? and then the rather special uh, reliance they had on their own vaccine and if you, to, the, to the extent that the population, which is truly enormous, uh, gives a large number of people with the, now with the problem. How are you able to do that if there can't be any global collaboration and cooperation and freedom of d data transmission, if you like? Are you able to think about that? Uh, I think that is something that we should definitely be thinking about. And of course, you're right, there is huge, just because this was a SARS virus, it was a huge political issue in itself. Um, I'm hoping that, I'm hoping that the WHO through their zero report are gonna be able to do things that China will embrace. And I'm hoping that we can get to a point where we can talk about ecological countermeasures with One Health within that, and that could have a big effect, but I think, but we have a we have a long way to go, and I think the, I mean, my guess is that Chinese philosophy is not going to embrace environmental issues immediately. But this is one of the multiple ways that we have to convince them. I think, I do agree, it's a big issue, big issue. What I'm trying to do at the moment is I've set up a film company to try and, and we're doing a film about. A uh, whole number of things, including this, this bat work, and we're doing another film on wolves. Uh, but one of the things that I'm hoping is that if we could make uh, films that could reach the Chinese, the Chinese, uh, particularly the young and things, maybe we could influence them to start to really appreciate this. Uh, so we have Ollie, and then a question right at the back. Uh, two questions at the back. Ollie. Thanks for a super talk. Um, what do you think is driving the increasing observations or spillovers of highly pathogenic bird flu into mammalian populations, and what can we do about it, if <laughs> oh, anything? Wow. Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's a bit unfair, coming to me on bird flu. Um, right at the back. Uh, yes. <laughs> there's, there's, <laughs> there's lots we need to do. Yeah. I haven't really got my head round at this moment, I was thinking about Hinnipus, but um, uh, yeah, I, so there is, I think there are lots of things we can do, and I really think we should be using new technology. I just don't think we're using these new serological techniques, and I'm very pro this idea of having an observatory for serology and things like that, but I'm not very keen on just the virome, just, just do the virome of the world, because I don't think that tells us that much. Thank you. Mike. Uh, thank you very much for that talk. Um, whilst I'm, like some others in the room have um, implied, I'm a bit unsure about the generalizability yep. of the story from Hendra into other um, ecosystems. I do think the idea is absolutely intriguing, and particularly the idea of intervention based on the, uh, the fact that you might be able to predict a year or more in advance of what might happen. 
you suggested this idea of feeding and substituting for the, the trees not flowering. And I was just interested in what the major objections to that have been. Um, so I wanted to, to convince you that um, an ecological need was, was required. I think the met and showing it in the Hendra virus with some evidence from Nipah virus only takes us some of the way. And I'm totally with you. I think the, you know, the jury's out for all the other infections. But it, what I'd like to do is get the big funding to go and examine those. So I'm not, uh, I, I'm not trying to convince you that it's the solution to everything. I'm just saying this is where we're at. But I, it's this whole idea of balancing the biological and ecological uh, countermeasures. Now, your, the question, which was about how, uh, why aren't people... So the other people in my group, and this is about one health group, so we brought these scientists together to do the interdisciplinary work, to do everything from the virology to understanding how people respond to bats and things like that. Uh, and I've been pushing this ever since the data came out, and the rest of the group are not keen on it. They just say, no, let's go and get more data. And as somebody trained in Oxford, maybe, but I just think we need a killer experiment. We need to go out and something so that you stand up at the back and go, Holy crap, that's right, that's I believe it now. That's what I want to do. Or, or it's, it only works on a Thursday because of this. But let's try and find out the truth. I just, I just really like killer experiments that really go, da -da, we've done it, we can show it. I think the research really needs to go through to productivity level. Clara, there is a question there. And just while you come up, uh, there's a question online from Catherine Shepherd <laughs> that I'm going to slightly rephrase. Do you think it's conceivable using current or future technologies that one might be able to induce immunity against the human pathogens in the reservoir species? Oh, Perhaps yeah. using viral vaccination and things like that. So I do think that's a possibility. I do think that, as I said, you know, you, we, you we talked about bit, transmissible yeah. vaccines. I think mm -hmm. there are other ways. Uh, I think that's just way out there. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. Okay, we're going to release these transmissible vaccines in these, in these rats. Well, Crikey, what, where's that going to go? How's that going to go? And so the vaccine deniers are going to go through the roof. But I think there are possibilities and the things that we need to think about. And what the Kiwis are trying to do for um, viral uh, sterilization of possums might, might actually be a uh, uh, proof of principle of that. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, lady there. Thank you for the very, uh, very interesting and very thought provoking uh, talk. So I uh, grew up in Malaysia, and I was actually a oh. around for the 1998 Nipah virus outbreak. So that is forever seared in my mind, and that's actually kind of what led me into epidemiology and all of that. But um, I have two controversial sort of opinions around some of the things you, you talked about. The first is that a pathogen is not really unknown ever. It's always in a community or a population until the world or you know the political bodies um, deem it worthy of being emerging. So that's one thing. And then the second is that I feel like with a lot of ecological destruction, there's a lot of uh, lack of um, consideration or courtesy towards populations that live already in that area. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of political buy-in that's needed both from governments, but also corporations thinking about palm yeah. oil um, harvesting and all of that. My question for you is, in the work that you've done, have you worked with indigenous peoples and ind indigenous populations and sort of considered maybe, you know, some of their oral histories and just the, their interactions with the pathogen um, over, over time and how that's sort of impacting spillover events now? So very, very interesting questions. Um, and I, I, I like your... Uh, comments about Nipper and then about pathogens, and I agree with you. I, I, remember, I remember some colleague in a department I was um, producing a paper, I said, I've just discovered this new lizard, and the people on the island where he discovered go, you didn't discover it. It's the first time you've found it. It's been here all along. And absolutely correct. You know, that's absolutely right. Uh, very interestingly, as Charles said at the beginning, 
I really love working with indigenous people, and I'm working with people in the Himalayas, and as Charles said, Maasai at the moment, and a number of other places. But that's, uh, that's it's just such fun working with them and getting that local knowledge and things. Um, so, yes, but I not in a situation where I could ever publish it, you know. That, I'm doing that more for fun, and I'm trying to see it through their eyes. So, for example, we've just done a I've just done a film with a, 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 somebody who's become a really close friend who lives up in the Himalayas, and it's about snow leopards, and it's about snow leopard conservation, seen through the eyes of, of the Ladakhi people and the uh, people on the Tibetan, the nomads on the Tibetan plateau, and they do the filming, they do everything, and then they show us their story, rather than the BBC Nash Geo coming in and going, hey, look at this, it's, it's amazing. And he was one of the guides for them, that's why he got so pissed off by it. And I met him in a bar, literally met him in a bar, and he, he and we started talking, and he said, I'm so fed up with these people coming and doing this. So I, I love your sentiments, and I wish I'd done more for you. So talking about meeting in bars, I'm afraid <laughs> we have run out what of time. <laughs> uh, I know there are a couple of people who wanted to ask Peter questions. I'll make certain, if you can come to have a drink, that you uh, chat to him over a glass of wine. Pete, that was really fun. Thank you so Thank much you. indeed.